Hey, I'm Joe Barnard, and today we're going to be talking about the avionics stack for Lumineer, the flight computers and electronics, which have, you know, they've, <laughs> they've seen some better days. Uh, this video is also sponsored by Wren, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So let's get started. Flight computers and avionics for high-powered rockets can do all sorts of things, and it really varies depending on the rocket, what your avionics are going to do. Some high-powered rockets don't even need flight computers at all. They use motor ejection to get the parachute out, and the only computers you'd fly are for data logging. Some high-powered rockets rely fully on the computers to get parachutes out, and some even down to the stability of the vehicle itself. And to add to this complexity, because of the inherent risk involved in high-powered rocketry, a lot of the times you want redundant avionics. Avionics. And to add even further to that, you often don't just want redundancy, but dissimilar redundancy, which means separate flight computer designs, separate code bases, separate manufacturers, so that if you did something wrong, or if you use some computer wrong, there's a totally separate system to back it up. For Lumineer, I opted to fly two computers. One was an AVA board manufactured by me, and the other was a Telemetrum computer manufactured by Altus Metrum. The Telemetrum is a dual deploy computer, but it can do a few other things. It has a GPS on board. It's able to broadcast telemetry on about 433 megahertz. I selected the Telemetrum because I had heard good reviews from friends who had used one, and I know that it's flight proven on a lot of high risk flights. On the AVA side of things, when the board was, you know, still functional, uh, it had capabilities to fire parachutes, track GPS coordinates, integrate accelerometers, a lot of the things that the telemetrum could do as well. AVA's telemetry radio was on 915 megahertz so that we didn't cross with the telemetrum. And AVA was also set up to control a reaction wheel, which like all of the electronics here has seen some better days. The avionics bay was set up with a drogue deployment piston in the center AVA on one sled, Telemetrum on another sled, and the third sled for the batteries. We also had two cameras in the avionics bay, one looking up, one looking out, and both died on impact. We actually have the SD cards and probably the footage from these cameras, but I can't get it off. Three out of the four SD cards on the rocket were cracked in some way or fractured, and so like, the footage exists on there. I know the data exists, I just can't access it. If you are some type of wizard who can resurrect a cracked SD card, like the ceramic chip has cracked. If you can do that, let me know. I am doubtful. Back to the avionics. Let's look at a very basic schematic to see how things are wired up. These schematics are really quick and dirty. The point is to get a sense for what wires go where and just basic functionality. Because the goal is redundancy between these two computers, we want them on totally separate power buses with total electrical isolation. So we'll do the schematic separately. For the telemetrum, we have a switch that is turned on by a screw through the wall of the airframe. This turns the computer on. On the Apogee pyro channel, we have the drogue charge. And on the main channel, we have the tender descender black powder charge. If you watch the recovery video, you'll know we actually had two redundant tender descenders. And the big secret here is that to add to all of this redundancy, each computer could fire both tender descenders. So we wired up four total pyro charges to the two tender descenders. Both could be fired either by the Telemetrum or AVA. To close this out, Telemetrum is powered by a 750 milliamp hour LiPo battery. AVA's schematic is a little more complex, and to the left, we've got all of our flight cameras operating at 14.8 volts, which are powered on by AVA. We direct the camera power through AVA because we want the ability to turn the cameras on or off. When the cameras are on, we're drawing something like two plus amps to power them all. This isn't terrible because we have a huge battery that's spec'd out for a reaction wheel, but we don't want to drain that power if the vehicle's idling on the pad for two hours, so we route it through AVA. AVA can then control the same things as Telemetrum, which is the two pyro channels for the drogue and main parachute. AVA is powered on using the power hatch that I mentioned in the airframe assembly video, but we arm the computer electrically using a screw switch through the wall. AVA also uses one of the PWM outputs to drive a speed controller for the reaction wheel 
wheel motor. And the ESC also has a separate power line which goes directly to the lithium polymer battery so that we don't have to route crazy amounts of amperage uh, through AVA, through the PCB itself. AVA broadcast telemetry using an external XB radio over 915 megahertz. And to close it out, we power the whole thing using a 2200 milliamp hour 4S LiPo. Now, a quick word about the reaction wheel. So this was a really cool idea that I did a really not cool job executing. I've said this before about Lumineer, but to re-emphasize it, we operated on an extremely crunched schedule. So I sent out step files and had a few different people manufacture reaction wheels to fly on Lumineer. I want to give a big thank you to those folks. So the first is Keith or Rocket Powered Keith on Twitter. Keith immediately volunteered to make one of these wheels. He did a fantastic job and it came out great. Next up, a huge thanks to Massa for making uh, several different versions of the reaction wheel with the BPS logo and their own on there. Finally, thank you to Daryl Yerk of Solitude Components. Um, Daryl, I am sorry, yours flew which is cool, but it's a little worse for the wear. So from the bottom of my heart, my bad. In terms of the control logic, I had my buddy Charlie Garcia draw up an attitude controller for the reaction wheel. He and a few friends took over the task of drawing up this attitude controller because I was focused on like just bringing this vehicle to launch. They worked really hard. They put in a bunch of effort and then we intentionally flew Ava with the reaction wheel turned off. Before we talk about why I did that, I wanna talk about why the reaction wheel was a bad idea in the first place. On a fundamental level, the reaction wheel for a high power rocket it does not make sense because you're resisting these aerodynamic torques that as you go through the boost phase are only getting stronger. And you're resisting these aerodynamic torques in a non-aerodynamic method that saturates quickly. In my case, I was also spinning a heavy and not professionally balanced mass at a higher and higher speed and that heavy, non-balanced mass was connected directly to the avionic stack with all of the inertial sensors. Like, <laughs> I don't know if you can see why that's a bad idea, but just trust me, it's a bad idea. One of the wildest things to think about is that as you ascend, you start storing momentum of a fully loaded vehicle in the reaction wheel, but you're losing mass as you ascend and like the inertia of the vehicle is going down. So you're storing more momentum in the wheel if you don't account for this as you go up you're storing more momentum in the, you know what? It's insane. Like the control problem is harder than it seems. And then finally, like all of that momentum is stored in the wheel. So when you reach apogee or when you reach some point when you're ready to dump that momentum, you have to put it back into the system and you're naturally just gonna roll the vehicle right back up if you stop moving that reaction wheel. And like, what are you gonna do? Drive this reaction wheel at 90 Hertz for like a 10 minute flight, it's really chaotic. Probably not. And so then you're like, okay, cool. Well, you'll dump the roll momentum at Apogee, right? Wrong. I mean, not wrong, but like, then you risk tangling up your drogue parachute. Anyway, all of this is to say, I think reaction wheels are a great idea at a small scale when your vehicle isn't going super fast and you don't have a lot of aerodynamic roll torque, but for high powered rockets, I think there are better ways to do it. All right, so on a fundamental level, the reaction wheel doesn't make sense, but I put in all of this effort to get this thing on the vehicle, like ready to go. So. Here is why we didn't fly it active. The TLDR is that we only finished building the attitude controller or the math behind the control logic in about a week before the launch. That in its own is concerning. But the more concerning thing is that like three days before launch, Charlie was like, you know what we should do? Let's just like see if it works. Just hold the avionic stack and see if it'll stabilize. So I loaded the code and we did that and it like oscillated a few times. We do not unfortunately have footage of this event. I'm like mentally losing my mind at this point. I'm holding the avionic stack. The wheel starts spinning up. It does resist the torques effectively. And I'm like, okay, cool, let's give it a kick. So I rotate it fast and it draws a crazy amount of current from the wheel and it browns out the entire avionic stack. And in that moment, it was like, Cool, it's three days before launch and we are gonna fly this wheel as dead mass. And then the best part about this story is you're like, okay, cool. So just take it offline and you increase the safety of the whole flight, right? <laughs> so like not 30 seconds after this, I tell Charlie, cool, we'll just unplug the ESC from the battery so we don't drain that extra like quiescent current. See how this ESC connects in the diagram here? We're disconnecting the red line and I forgot to disconnect the black line. And you know what? is inside of an electronic speed controller is a tremendous number and 
amount of capacitance. And you know what happens when you plug into a capacitor bank? Um, the capacitor bank charges and it does that pretty fast. So I forgot to unplug the PWM cable from Ava and uh... <laughs> Favorite thing about Luminear right now is the wireless video. So we're gonna plug in. Okay, there's the video. Everyone wanna take a look? We're gonna power on via the power hatch. Power hatch. Oh, that was a loud pop. Oh. Oh no. I smell something hot. I smell it too. Me too. I burned it. Ava. So essentially, we took the reaction wheel offline to make the system safer, and it killed the computer as a result. Really as a result of me not thinking through the schematic. There's a lesson to be learned here, um, and the piece of information I'm not sharing is that right when I pitched the idea of unplugging the ESC, Charlie said, hey buddy, that's not what your schematic says. Have you ever flown it or ever tested it in the state where the ESC isn't plugged in? And I was like, what do you know, man? It's just positive and ground. Like, it doesn't matter. So the lesson to be learned here is when someone gently pitches the concept that like, maybe this isn't an excellent idea or maybe you should think this through, the correct response is not, I know more than you. <laughs> Moving on, I have a few random facts that I couldn't find a good place for in the video, so we'll just talk about them here. This is less about the computers and more about the wiring, but all of the cable runs that went through the vehicle used separate types of connectors. This is really important to me, and I think it should be important to you too if you're building something like this. You should never ever be able to plug two different cables into each other that shouldn't go together. Moving on, every cable that went into one of Ava's or Telemetrum's screw terminals uh, used solid core wire. Screw terminals are built for solid core wire. Frayed wire is not really what you want there. You also want those solid core wires to not be tinned. You don't want to tin the tip of them with solder. Solder compresses easily. And over time, you can compress the wire down and you lose that grip that you get from the screw terminal. Screw terminals in general are just kind of a bad idea with high power rockets. I live with them with Ava. I'm not stoked about it. Um, they can be used, but they are also susceptible to backing out in really high vibration environments. And do you know what vibrates a lot? It's rockets. It's rockets that vibrate a lot. So if you can avoid using screw terminals, you probably should, but if you have to use them, there are a couple of ways to, to make them work. Moving on, each computer has a way to electrically disconnect the pyro charges. This is really important, and you can't just rely on digital arming of these pyrotechnic charges. Physical arming is critical. You should not be able to have any type of current path that could possibly fire one of the charges until you are prepared to fire one of those charges. And in this case, prepared means that you know that you're in a higher than normal risk scenario. Usually that's on the launch pad and you're prepared to like bail out if you need to. And the final point here is that all batteries for the avionics stack were sized to give this thing like hours and hours of on time. I think if you were to look at it from a outside perspective, it might seem like overkill to have, you know, seven or eight hours of powered on time for the whole vehicle but when you're searching for stuff in the desert, sometimes it takes a little while. With all that covered, here's a little bit of the footage of us prepping the avionics bay for flight. All right, we're rolling. It's not how we die. It's just like, don't touch it, and it will be fine. Lockout. Apogee lockout. What do you want to say, 25? Yes, yeah, so your apogee is at 45 seconds. In your nominal simulation, are you subsonic? At 25 seconds. Oh god, all right. Uh, open rockets. Okay, so this is the telemetry module. We don't need anything else for now. Tight. Tight. Yep. This is why we do checklists. Yep. Will it be fine with three screws? Almost certain. Sure. Do you want a fourth screw for, yes. for safety? Yes, I do. You do. <laughs> like, you never feel like you need a checklist until you do a checklist, and then you realize how many things that past you, past you wrote down that, few, that present you doesn't know. Okay, so we just we just did a bunch of checkouts. The av bay is in pretty good shape. We do need to put a battery in. We need to wire up the tender descenders, which will um, allow the main chute to come out. Um, but like, it's going well. It's 10.40 a.m. Um, we've been at this since like eight, and I'm in a much better spot today than I was 
especially on Friday last week. All oh, right, good. you ready? So we're just gonna hot glue this in because this is a slight risk um, at 10 Gs of acceleration. I feel like it's more than a slight risk. It's like, <laughs> can we just say it's a slight big risk? Big risk, man. Play it off as if it's not a big deal. All right, you ready? Yeah. So hot glue is easy to remove. Isopropyl alcohol. Yep. And then, so Adam's just taking a shower. The next stuff is shoots. I'm gonna start um, laying those out a little bit in here. Um, and then we integrate, which is really scary because that is the last time that I see, I mean, launch is tomorrow, but that's the last time that I see my avionic stack before I either see it on the ground or I see it in the ground or I don't see it. All three are, are likely. <laughs> you got this. All right, great. <laughs> what I'm gonna do um, yeah, is so um, force it open and then we're gonna check the length and then we're gonna close it and that will be the last time that we close it. Okay. Okay. So that right works. now we're, we're, like, we're like pulling vacuum to get it all the way out. Uh -huh. Wow, that's a good seal. 14.8 volts nominal. Okay, great. 4.2 times 4, 16.4 volts full charge. 16.8. 16.8, thank we're you. We're at 16.73, so that yeah. we're counting it as full. Yeah, I buy it. Part is before then, so we're just gonna sort of like. It's it's L minus one, and we're on L minus zero checklist activity. Which is the opposite of where we were last week, where we, it was L minus zero, and we were running L minus one checklists. Yeah. Okay, so here's the best part about this build series. I'm gonna open this while I do it. The best part about this is that like the beginning videos will be like, oh wow, he's put a lot of forethought into this. <laughs> and, uh, there, are, there are cool heads, we're making good decisions. And by this phase, I am <laughs> I am constantly on the verge of tears. <laughs> oh. Favorite thing about Luminia right now is the wireless video. So we're gonna plug in. Okay. There's the video. Everyone wanna take a look? We're gonna power on via the power hatch. Power hatch. Oh, that was a loud pop. Oh. Oh no. I smell something hot. I smell it too. Me too. I burned it. Ava. How? I don't know. Because inductance of the motor. No. We have less power draw than we did before. Something shorted. Um, a short could do it. What burned on Ava? It'll be the voltage regulator. Um, when we have a really big power inrush, um, it can mm -hmm. fry the voltage. Yep, we've seen this before. Yes. And so I thought the problem had been mitigated by connecting ground first. And it seemed, over every test I've done, to do just that. But that was a pretty serious pop. Cannot be this. The reaction wheel is unplugged this time. Gosh, I, I... Did we test in the reaction wheel unplugged configuration before? I'm like pretty sure. It's just Ava. And we're drawing less current than we would be. Can we disconnect the power leads to Ava and check them for continuity and see if- That's a great idea. Else? Let's start there. Um, we are gonna have to redo this checklist and probably in a different, oh, you are, <laughs> I got it. Oh, bless, bless you. Wait, can you hold that pen up again? <laughs> okay. Say it with me. There is a path to flight. It is 4 p.m. You're six hours ahead of schedule, fam. Yes, there is a path to flight. Yes, there is. I am. You are calm. I'm quite done you got at this, this point, but there is a path to flight. So There's we're gonna. Path to flight. It is 4 p.m. Path to flight is 4 p.m. Sure. I'm gonna speed run this. Oh no, oh no, are there nuts on the back of this? I think there might be. Oh, it's so hard to take this off. Oh, please, just end it all. Okay, here we go. Wait, uh, proposal. Oh, I hate interning at this company. <laughs> we're all wild people, but like, I think the, the trait that we share is that we're pretty cool under pressure and, oh, the pressure is rising. <laughs> That has never been a problem in the in the setup that I have. Oh, you know what? I know where it happened. Where? You're still connected to the signal line on the reaction wheel, aren't you? Oh it my God, Charlie! Oh my God! Oh my God! Hold my hands! Oh my God! You genius! You. F
fucking genius. That is it. That's the path. Yeah. We sank all of that all current. Oh my god, and it went right through. Oh my god. That's it. That's probably what fried the last one. Wow. It works. Okay. Cool. Woo! And it's got the beeps! Holy moly. Okay. Yeah, so similar. I wish I had more done. Okay. You got this. So just keep your eyes on this. Yes, sir. And keep your fingers crossed. You ready? Fingers yeah. crossed for you, fam. Three, two, one. Enable cameras. Cameras on. Status on. One, two, three. That's a live feed. Hey, yo! Uh, hot glue SD card into Ava. Done. Uh, hot glue SD cards into avionics cameras. Done. Hot glue SD cards into vehicle side cameras. Done. Uh, check out photos of the Ava face. Oh my god, new ones. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's one. That's tight. Um, Charlie, do you mind? I've got, the, I've got the mission package. This Thank is two. You. I want good shots. Those there's, need. There's the so got photos and torque stripes. Oh god, yeah, you're right. I hate that you are, but it is true. Okay. We're gonna turn everything right. upside yep. down. We're both gonna do it. Yep. All right. Now we have some alignment to do. The last line. Uh, yeah. Hold on. This is uh. Normally, normally chill, but your boy needs the the space ATM. Oh my God, it's working! Do we want to try a power on? Uh, we should. Okay, I I, I agree. <laughs> it's me, Joey. Please watch over us as we power on. All right, you ready? Is that it, man? Fast. Like somehow this is way worse than the other <laughs> ones. Oh! Okay. Yeah, that's it. That's that's ground idle. That's uh. Oh! Yes. All right. The night before the flight, we powered on the avionics with no booster section attached. The telemetry looked clean and strong, so we pushed forward to flight the next morning. The first flight of that day was USC RPL with their Control V vehicle. Three, two, one, ignition. We had Ava flying on board as a passive payload to help capture more data for their flight. And once they got off the pad, we set up Lumineer a little further away. Around this time, I started the live stream, which I will link in the description below so you can watch us prep if you want. Once the vehicle launched, we lost almost all telemetry at around four kilometers up. We actually lost telemetry on both computers, 915 and 433 megahertz. I will keep this section short, but the TLDR is that RF is essentially black magic and we should have done a lot more range testing on the ground. The radios were sandwiched between two huge chunks of metal inside the vehicle. The lower one was the motor forward retainer, which is called an aero pack, and the upper one is this massive brass reaction wheel. We were also really lax about our data downlink budget, which means that we were nearly saturating the bandwidth while on the ground, and the bandwidth is only going to go down as you go up. We did, however, get flight data that was recorded on AVA and then reviewed after the fact, so I figured we could take a look at that. We'll start off here by looking at our barometric altitude, which puts us at an apogee of about 9.7 kilometers, so a little shy of 10. We can also see some interesting barometric effects as we break the speed of sound and then drop back below it. When we get going fast enough, if you look at this plot right here, you'll see that the GPS reports no satellites in view and no GPS fix when we pass about 500 meters per second. We can also see our GPS altitude just stop updating at about that point. This makes sense. The GPS I use in the data sheet says it will not work faster than that speed. That's called a COCOM limit, and it's a limit within a lot of GPS receivers. It basically says like, you can't use this on a missile. If you start going too fast, it's gonna get angry and tell you, no, I'm, I won't do it. We can also take a look at our accelerations here, and we actually have three accelerometers on the vehicle, which gives us some really cool data to correlate the three sensors. The first is our high G Excel or high gravity accelerometer. This picks up the launch transient really well. We have an average acceleration of somewhere around like 90 meters per second squared, and then this little tiny peak of acceleration at about 115 meters per second squared. The other two accelerometers that we have on the vehicle are configured for lower Gs, and they can't quite read 
achieved that high of an acceleration. So you can see them cap off here. You can also see some things maybe possibly shifting around inside the vehicle. There are some uncomfortable acceleration events that I am not a super big fan of here. If we look at the off axis accelerations, which are the accelerations not in the vertical axis, we can see a pretty violent shock happen. And it looks like this happens around when we go supersonic. We all been new, like transonic is a really sketchy place aerodynamically. And we sort of have the data to confirm that the vehicle gets a little whipped around when we pass the speed of sound. Ava logs these things so we can see the command to fire pyro channel one right around Apogee, which fires our drogue charge. Apart from the RF stuff, both computers on this flight functioned flawlessly and did their job to the best of their ability. Telemetrum and Ava both independently sent the drogue firing command within 0.3 seconds of each other. So they both had a very good agreement on what Apogee was. That said, the Telemetrum did get there first. We can see in the acceleration data that the drogue charge fires just a little before Ava sends the command. So Ava was a little bit delayed. I can't quite claim that my own flight computer got the shoots out. On the way down, Telemetrum and Ava also both fired their respective tender to sender charges. We also got very lucky on the way down. We had a period of reorientation of the vehicle where the polar patterns of the ground and flight antennas matched up well enough to get a couple of GPS packets through, and we were able to use those packets to ultimately find the vehicle. Once we got the vehicle back, one of the first things that I did in the days after launch was extract the lithium polymer battery from the very crunchy avionics bay. Obviously, you can't slide the avionics package out at this point, so I had to sort of destructively disarm this essentially like lithium polymer um, fire waiting to happen. So I had to go back and look at the CAD to find where the battery was and then be really, really careful about where I dremeled through the airframe so that I wouldn't accidentally cut into that LiPo. Both Telemetrum and Ava ended up being in somewhat non-wonderful states, which is to say they were absolutely both dead. And you might be wondering to yourself, hey Joe, how come you were able to show all that flight data if the computers were dead? I am getting uncomfortably good at extracting flight data from dead computers. I don't love that I have done it this many times, but it is not that hard to desolder the flash chip on one computer and then like put it on another one and get the data off that way. I would love if I wasn't getting so good at this skill. <laughs> anyway, that's about it for the Luminaire avionics video. I learned a ton of lessons in building this avionics stack, and we're gonna carry those all forward into the high power rockets that I build in the future. We should have at least one more coming up this year, and then we have a bunch coming up next year. Thank you so much for watching, and in the next video, we're going to cover motor integration, which is honestly like just, just like prepare yourself for uh, an amount of chaos. And now it is sponsor time. This video is sponsored by Wren. Wren is a website where you can calculate your carbon footprint and then offset that carbon footprint by supporting projects which plant trees, protect rainforests, etc. The climate crisis is happening and like it's not very good, but you can use Wren to help offset your impact on it. You can use Wren's footprint calculator to evaluate your impact and learn about how you can reduce it. Obviously, it's unlikely that you'll be able to get down to zero impact, but for what you can't eliminate, you can offset with monthly contributions to projects which make a positive impact. It's going to take a Herculean effort to end the climate crisis, and the only way to do that is through collective action of lots of people. So you can do your part by heading to Ren.co. With Ren, you'll get to look at where your money goes to help understand the impact that you've had. I've partnered with Ren to plant 10 trees for the first 100 people who sign up using the link on screen and in the description below. Thank you again to Ren for sponsoring today's video and thanks to you for watching. My name is Joe Barnard. May your skies be blue and your winds be low.